Welcome to the People Who Read People podcast with me, Zach Elwood. If you're new to this podcast, its focus is human psychology and behavior. If you'd like to learn more about this podcast, you can go to readingpokertells.video slash blog to see episode summaries and links. In this episode, recorded April 13th, 2021, I interview Scott Stossel, national editor of the magazine The Atlantic. Stossel also is the author of a book called My Age of Anxiety, Fear, Hope, Dread, and the Search for Peace of Mind. That book is a history of humanity's understanding and treatment of anxiety, and it's also a personal history, with Scott recounting his struggles with extreme anxiety and phobias of various sorts from a young age. One of the best things about the book is Scott's honesty in talking about his own life, something that is understandably hard to do. I talked to Scott about his anxiety and anxiety in general. And along the way, I talk about my own struggles with anxiety, which have been quite different from Scott's. Hi, Scott. Thanks for coming on. Uh, Thanks for having me. So I know you did a lot of interviews regarding your book back when it came out in 2013. I was just curious, have you, do you still do many interviews about this book? I don't know about many. It's, it's obviously the, the frequency uh, has dropped off since 2014 and, and 2015 when the hardcover and the paperback came out. But I, I do do them uh, occasionally. People will reach out from various venues and other podcasts and so forth. One thing I loved about your book was the the personal aspect of it, the examination of all the potential origins of anxiety in your own life. And on the one hand, you've got nature in the form of genetics and all the ways one's family tree might contribute to one's anxiety. And on the other side, you've got nurture and all the ways your parents' behavior might contribute to your anxiety. And I think what makes your book great in that respect was your openness and talking about your life, which is rare and hard for people to do. And the fact also that your journalistic background meant that you wouldn't settle for easy answers, that you were committed to looking at all the evidence, even if that meant that we're still left with so much uncertainty about you know these factors in our lives. And so I'm curious, when you initially had the idea for this book, did you imagine it as a shorter, simpler book? Did you know that it would be such a long and complex research project for both the psychology history part of it and your own history part of it? Yeah, I mean, I honestly the the final form that it took was not so different um from how I imagined it at at the beginning. You know, I knew I always wanted to from the outset I I I had a sense that I wanted to blend my kind of personal story with uh kind of a more scholarly and and journalistic investigation of various, you know, causes and manifestations and treatments um and kind of, you know, culture of anxiety. I, I didn't know what the details would be. I didn't know if I'd be able to pull it off. I didn't, uh, I had all kinds of misgivings about putting myself out there in terms of my personal story, but I had not long before I started doing this, um, Andrew Solomon, who's a terrific writer had written a book called the noonday demon. And the subtitle was an Atlas of depression, which kind of was the model that I had in my head. I mean, he, he basically did for depression, what I set out to do for anxiety, which was kind of, you know, weave his personal story together with cultural, intellectual, scientific, sort of journalistic exploration. So, so that, that, that was my model. So I, I did want to do that. It's funny that, you know, the, the, the way I got the idea to do this book, the moment it occurred to me was when I was getting ready to do publicity tour for my first book, um, which came out in 2004, which was a very different kind of book, you know, just sort of political history. And I was overwhelmed with anxiety about doing the, you know, public speaking and all that. And and was just miserable. And, um, you know, I was like, geez, really what I should be writing about is like th- this horrible experience of, of anxiety that I have and all the things that have, you know, brought me to this point. I think it was almost a way of c- trying to get through that first book tour that I started um, telling myself, well, you know, if I have a complete meltdown, you know, on TV or, you know, on stage or something, at least it will be fodder for my next book. <laughs> um, and, and honestly, that was a way of trying to cope and get get myself through it. And I don't know if it helped, but it did. It did get me propelled towards doing this this anxiety book. Have you had people tell you that the book helped them with their own anxiety issues? And if so, what are the things, the common things that people have told you have helped them the most? Yeah, that's been one of the most gratifying and, and honestly surprising things about this is that, um, you know, still to this day, I, I, you know, a couple times a month, if not more, I will get notes sort of over email from all over the world because, you know, the book's been translated into into a number of languages. And so, you know, I'll get from people in America, but also like Brazil or Romania or France, 
um, you know, and sometimes in sort of broken English saying in various ways, you know, thank you for publishing this, this book. And, you know, some of, some of them are from psychiatrists and psychologists who are saying, you know, we, I appreciated the, the way you approach this and I give it to my patients. And, you know, this is a good articulation of kind of some of the phenomenology of anxiety. The, the ones that are sort of most both gratifying and puzzling to me are people who, who write and say like, you know, your book cured me or, um, <laughs> You know, I feel so much better for having having read your book. And those people, I want to say, like, what page, you know, are you reading that's giving you the cure? Because I want to go in and and read it because I'm not better and I don't understand. Like, yeah, why I'm, was it very, so easy? Yeah. yeah, exactly. I'm glad that it's it's helped you. I mean, a lot of people say the way it helped them is it just made them feel less alone. I think for people right, who right. who who maybe didn't, especially for people who hadn't been in treatment or you know had never been formally diagnosed but knew they were anxious, read it and were sort of like they recognize themselves in some aspect or another and you, whether it was in you know some aspect of my story or in all the stories of like various people from history or famous people that I talk about I, I think that was you know for a lot of people and, and that was in researching it one thing that I found very consoling is like oh like I'm not the first person to go through this mm-hmm. in fact you know many many people throughout all of history have gone through this and some of them have managed you know to do very you know, successful things or, you know, lead satisfying lives. And, and there's just some comfort in, in that. And I think, I think that's probably what most people got. Again, I wish I knew, you know, people could say like, oh, it was the thing on page 73 where you said X, it just made me feel better. I, I, I still don't know what that, what, what the people who, who feel like completely transformed by There's actually a guy, a, a musician in Atlanta who, who wrote a whole book. It was his memoir, but he talks in the memoir about how, I, you know, he suffered from panic attacks his whole life. And, you know, reading my book sort of helped him basically get cured from it. Um, mm. <laughs> I was just like, wow. again, very gratifying, but not, I, I'm not cured from it. So <laughs> right. someone else yeah, needs to I read think, a book uh, that will get me. <laughs> well, I think, uh, yeah, I mean, I think you've pointed out the the main factor here is it, why these things are so helpful. I think it's just it, the fact that we're not alone, which I think for some people may not be as obvious as for other people, you know, like you said, if, if they haven't read much about it or sought treatment that ha- has showed them that before, you know, reading a book like yours, where someone honestly talks about those struggles, it, that alone, even if it's not even the same struggles, it's just recognizing like, oh, there are some common things here and people can suffer from really bad things and and still be quite functional. You know, that it, I think that's the, that is the power. And that's why I recommended your book to, to so many people is, is saying, Look, it might not be the exact thing you're dealing with, but just the the idea that we're all having various types of struggles is, is powerful. Yeah. Yep. No, I think I think that's right. When it comes to the uh, the specific kinds of drugs or therapies, because you know you've you've tried a lot, as you describe in your book, it, does anything jump out to you as you know? Are there certain uh, approaches that for someone who was suffering from anxiety who maybe hasn't delved into the the treatment side of things, are there any specific things that you would start with like, you know, maybe start with some cognitive behavioral therapy stuff. Is there there anything that stands out as general advice? Although I know that everyone's different, so it might be hard to to make a general bit of advice. Yeah. I mean, I will say, obviously everyone is different and people respond differently to different modes of of, of treatment, but you're exactly right that that these days, the sort of preferred first line of treatment, I think for most therapists, um, and psychiatrists uh, uh, is cognitive behavioral therapy. And that's basically working on two things. I mean, in my case, you know, I had a lot of phobias and and social anxiety and general, generalized anxiety. And it's a combination of sort of you know, what they call reframing your cognitions. And that's, you know, if there are cognitive distortions in our thinking that we are sort of misperceiving the reality of a threat or, you know, overestimating how dangerous or scary or damaging something is going to be to us, you know, basically correcting that. And then, you know, through exposure therapy, um, you know, confronting yourself with a thing that makes you anxious, uh, sort of builds up your confidence. And then again, helps you to reframe how, how you think about all this, that mode of therapy, you know, cognitive behavioral therapy, according to sort of most of the papers that you read is, is sort of the most efficacious treatment. Um, you know, and it has the advantage of, um, not being dependency forming the way that some drugs are, it doesn't have side effects. So if you can do that and it works, that's great. The problem is that nothing is 100%. Um, and, and many things don't work for many people and that, you know, even the most promising 
kind of study findings about cognitive behavioral therapy suggests that, you know, it works maybe for 30, 40, 50%. I don't know what the latest numbers are, but, um, you know, that's a certain, that there's a large number of people for whom it doesn't work. And even for those people that it does work for, it needs to be kind of constantly reinforced. Like it, if you do cognitive behavioral therapy and then you sort of let it lapse and you're not confronting yourself with a thing you're afraid of, you kind of get at least, and this is true in my own case, I get like reset to factory settings, you know, that I came out with, um, and I'm back to being anxious. So it's, it's not a permanent s- solution. You know, there are various other forms of, you know, th- th- there's a lot of evidence that just any kind of therapy, talk therapy, psychodynamic therapy, which is basically, you know, going to a therapist and talking things through, you know, there are c- cognitive behavioral aspects to that you know, that may not be as formal as in structured cognitive behavioral therapy, but you get that benefit. There's just sometimes just being able to share your problems, unburden yourself, have a sympathetic listener, problem solving, that that can help. Um, There are various, there are all kinds of other talk therapies of different styles and strains that have, you know, different people will tell you that they have different effectiveness. And then you get into medication. There's a whole vast set of of those. Um, Mm -hmm. We can talk about that if you want. Well, yeah. And a quick thing I'm I'm curious about, if you if you agree with this, because and obviously with the preface of you know I'm not a, I'm not a doctor and talk to your doctor, but one one thing when I talk to people about anxiety, I actually just talked to a, a friend yesterday about his his anxiety. One of my things I often recommend is that one of the values of, of having a prescription like lorazepam, for example, is is that these things can break cycles of anxiety in your life. And for example, that was how it was that drug was specifically helpful for me. It wasn't it wasn't like it was a fix all or a long-term solution, but it did help in terms of like our minds can get kind of stuck in these cycles and just being able to break that cycle a bit and and be like, oh, well now I can, my mind can function in a different way for a while. And I I don't have to be in that exact cycle. I feel like that is part of the value of medications. And I think that sometimes that can even be, you know, whether it's debatable, what exactly all these medications are doing, doing, sometimes I feel like it's just breaking a cycle that you're in. And that in itself can be valuable. And I'm curious if you agree with that general idea. Yes, uh, for, for certain. Although there's, you know, complications with, with, with some of these drugs. So, so for me, you know, for a long time, I mean, I started taking, you know, the lorazepam and, you know, the Ativan is a, is a species of benzodiazepine, which has been around since the sixties, you know, first came in the form of Librium and then Valium and then Xanax was sort of the big breakthrough one in the 1980s was faster acting and clonopin. And, um, and for me that, uh, any of those was the most effective way when I got into kind of a state of acute anxiety and whether that was a panic attack, you know, it takes a while to kick in, but like when I was really kind of going off the rails in terms of my fight or flight reaction spinning and, and just, you know, if you've experienced panic attacks, like they're just, they can be mm-hmm. horrific and it would kind of pull me back from that, but also like severe anticipatory anxiety. If I was like dreading something and just couldn't stop ruminating, that gets into sort of what you were talking about, breaking the cycle. And then, yeah, if you're sort of cycling down where you're just the the rumination and the dread just get deeper and deeper and deeper and then you start having trouble sleeping and that makes mm-hmm. the anxiety worse being able to take something like lorazepam or clonopin you know can, for me for a long time was kind of a lifesaver and sometimes um simply knowing that I had it available to take, you know, no matter how things got, I could take a lorazepam and, um, and I knew that that would help. And if things still got worse, I could take another lorazepam, you know, and that really was, um, sort of a magic elixir, you know, and, and it's chemical agency. It basically sort of slows the firing I- in your amygdala. Um, it, it affects- basically a sedative effect, which I, I'll say lorazepam was a, a godsend for me too. Like I wish I had discovered it much earlier because it made me feel I had such high anxiety as a, as a young person that it made me feel when I took it that I was like, this is how normal people must feel who don't deal with anxiety. It just, and, and for people that don't have anxiety, it, ha- it did have like a sedative, too sedative effect. But for me, it just made me feel like normal because I think my brain was just so high strung or something. And I think that's when you talk about the breaking cycles. I and mean, that's why I've said to people like, this is the value of these things because you do get stuck in these ruminative cycles where you're fearing the anxiety coming on and such. And just knowing that you have something to combat it does so much for you, just that alone too. No, it's exactly as you say. I mean, I remember being on a, a plane flight once having taken a clonopin and, and, and sort of being like, geez, I feel okay. This is, you know, flying used to cause me a, a significant anxiety, still does actually. But it, but it's, it, it's, it's like, wait, is this what, you know, other people just feel like all the time, like this <laughs> right. is just okay. And I can, I mean, and, and I'll get into, you know, benzodiazepines can be a, a drug of abuse and can you know, lead to dependency and addiction. Mm-hmm. 
Um, but it was, it was never like I was getting high or felt, it didn't feel like I was feeling like better than I was supposed to be normal. It was better than normal for me. I was just getting back to like, okay, now I can function. I can have conversations that would otherwise be stressful for me without tremendous distress. Mm -hmm. But the problem for me though, as it is for many, many people, and this is the danger and sort of the tragedy of, of, of the benzos is that in part, I think because it was such a magic elixir for me, I, and because I have, you know, pretty chronic and acute anxiety, you know, actually this happened. I talk in the book about how wonderful, um, and, and sort of magic the, the benzos could be for me and help me, you know, do all kinds of things I wouldn't otherwise have been able to. Since the book came out, um, you know, my, and, and in part, you know, through publishing the book, cause I had to do all kinds of flying around the country and lecturing and, and, and going on TV. I, my use of, uh, benzos sort of became higher. And what happens is you build up a tolerance. And so I needed to take more and more in order to achieve the same sedative effect. And it basically got to the point where I was sort of, you know, I couldn't get th- through the day. You know, I, I, ne- I started to need benzos to get through what had been lower and lower stakes, lower anxiety situations. But because I be- was becoming physiologically dependent on them, simply being without them would cause sort of rebound anxiety, mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm. where you'd have kind of like a withdrawal that, um, you know, when it gets really severe, you can start, it can start to be quite dangerous, but you know, at the lower level, it's just, you start to feel more anxious and you want another Ativan or another Xanax. And again, it doesn't happen to everybody. I mean, this is the confounding thing and the difficult thing, you know, I, I still carry with me at all times Ativan. I rarely take it nowadays. I've, I've basically, it's, it's, I can no longer use it as that kind of magic bullet because as I say, it, it, you know, and also cause I was also using alcohol, which is a very effective anxiolytic remedy. You know, it, it, it has sort of the same effect and kind of dampening activity in your brain and that, that reduces anxiety and, and induces well being. But, you know, using them in combination as I sometimes was for, you know, particularly acute anxious situations. Again, it was always very effective, but it started to become, I, I started to need to use that combination for more and more things. And that became problematic. And that is very, unfortunately, quite common. Um, Mm -hmm. And so it's when, um, and it's, it's a little bit in the nature of, you know, the opioids where, where they are very, very effective as painkillers. Some people can use them just fine and they stop when the, when, you know, you're recovered from surgery or when the broken bone is healed or your back is better. Other people develop basically a physical addiction and it's not the classic, uh, I mean, for me, I kept thinking, well, I can't be addicted. I'm not, I'm a well-behaved, you know, bourgeois citizen. I, I, I only take them as prescribed. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not using street drugs or ordering things from the dark web. The problem is even using it though, you know, in, in that way, if you use more and more of it, you can descend into basically addiction. Uh, and then of course that just sends your anxiety off the charts. Yeah, I'll say for me personally, even when I used uh, lorazepam frequently when I was younger, I, I would occasionally go cold turkey just because I knew that, you know, I, I wanted to reset my body basically. So that's one strategy. And I also say me also, even though I, similar to you, I used to take them quite a bit. I, I haven't taken one for a couple of years now. So I think uh, just to put all that in context and, but de- yeah, definitely something to be aware of is the addictive nature of them and the, uh, the tolerance. And like you say, too, aside from the addiction, I think there's also the, they can get in the way of, of solving the problem long term. If that's, you know, there, there has to be more to it than just that solution. Yeah. You know, it runs into, you know, even putting aside, as you say, the, the dependency and addiction, you know, hardcore sort of purist cognitive behavioral therapists would say, and I talk about this in my book, I had these two therapists who were sort of dueling and one was a cognitive behavioral therapist who I called Dr. Stanford. And one was a psychopharmacologist who I called Dr. Harvard, who was, you know, prescribing me benzos and other medication. And, and the cognitive behavioral therapist would say, you can't do proper exposure therapy if you're taking Xanax or Ativan. You know, you're just, you're not actually confronting the thing you, you fear. You're using this, this crutch. Um, so you're not, you're not going to, you know, part of the CBT is believe, you know, coming to believe that you can overcome this fear, that you can endure it. Um, mm-hmm. And there's, there's truth to that. You know, what Dr. Harvard would then say is, or what I would be afraid of is what, what if my anxiety is just so overwhelming? Like I can't, I can't do the exposure unless I have a little bit of Ativan in my system. Um, you know, so there's, there can be a happy medium where that is sort of what I would do for some of these treatments is, you know, take a little bit and then, and then try to taper down while confronting more and more anxious triggers. 
there's no simple answers because I think it ties into things like, uh, you know, using MDMA and, and uh, psilocybin and such for therapy, because the, one of the values of those things is they do allow you to take a distance view of your, you know, you're basically like taking this remove view and, it, and that allows you to deal, you know, to process traumatic thoughts and experiences better in that removed place. So I think, I don't think there's any easy answers there because while you have to, at, so, at some level, you have to confront what you're dealing with, but there is value to almost taking that break and seeing it from a different angle. Yeah. One thing about anxiety that's been interesting to me is how much it can vary in its presentation. And to take one example, your anxiety that you write about in your book was very much outwardly focused in terms of it was focused on real events that could happen, like whether that was fear of vomiting or planes crashing or other disasters befalling you. And your anxiety was very much physical in the sense that it made you literally physically ill with nausea and gastrointestinal issues and such. And to take another side of things, my anxiety was very inwardly focused, and I've never feared physical things that much. I've done skydiving and other adrenaline-producing physical activities uh, with no problem. But my anxiety manifested more as a feeling that I was just abnormal and broken and that my life and existence was hopeless and uh, a fear of going crazy, these kinds mm -hmm. of things. And it had more of a like kind of a catatonic schizophrenic quality of, of being overwhelmed by reality and people. And I wonder what you think about these these different presentations of anxiety. Do you think it points to the fact that we try to boil down all these complex and diverse experiences to these simple words like depression or anxiety or schizophrenia? And maybe that's our, our language, the way we try to group these complex things is part of the reason why these problems can be so hard to get a handle on and solve. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's almost like human language is I insufficient to, to be able to capture the, the, the range of these experiences and at the same time sort of dissect them and divide them properly. Because it's, I mean, it, the, the problem goes two directions. You know, on the one hand, you know, in the, you know, the diagnostic and statistical manual, the DSM, which is the sort of Bible of, of, you know, psychiatry and psychology and therapeutic professions, you know, it lays out what all the, 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 the clinical psychiatric diagnoses are. And it, and it tries to, you know, define them all by precise sets of symptoms and duration and all that. And, you know, it's, it's, they're all valid to an extent because they will, you know, apply studies to them and so forth, but it's somewhat, it's all somewhat arbitrary. And, you know, right now we distinguish, say, you know, anxiety from depression or generalized anxiety from, you know, dysthemia or depression and, uh, you know, OCD from other kinds of anxiety and there's different kinds of de depression and bipolarity. It's, it's, we don't really have a scientific basis for knowing, you know, either that, you know, do I, you know, that my anxiety as I've been diagnosed is distinct from someone else's depression, which has anxious characteristics, or for that matter, that my anxiety, which takes one permutation is, you know, is it really the same anxiety, the same set of underlying genetics, neurobiology, uh, kind of cognitive processes that underlies your um, anxiety, or are they in fact distinct things? And, you know, the, the, Historically, you know, going back a couple hundred years, you know, uh, or 150 years, you know, to Freud and pre-Freud, you know, they would try to make distinctions based uh, purely on what you could observe, which was behavior and, you know, descriptions of symptoms. As we've gotten further along, you could start to make distinctions based on kind of after the fact, like which drugs worked for which described symptoms and, and, and in what ways. And then you kind of, after the fact, you know, carve out these, these things now that you've got, you know, both, you can put people's in a, in a, in a MRI machine and look at how their brains are working and, and you can also do genetic testing and you can, you know, start to try to identify, okay, this gene or this constellation of genes like leads to a predisposition to be being high strung or to being sociopathic or to having dissociative qualities. Um, you know, it starts to be like, well, okay, maybe we can actually pin this down to, you know, basically full nature. But even there, they can't, you know, there's nothing has, there, there's, there's rarely a one-to-one -one correlation of if you have this gene mutation that you, then you will be quote unquote schizophrenic or, you know, because some people who have an underlying genetic dis predisposition to be neurotic don't develop full-blown anxiety disorders and other people do. So there's a, you know, sort of gene environment interaction. Anyway, this, this is a very long-winded answer to your question, which is, 
uh, you know, I, I think some years from now, I mean, we, we are still quite crude um, in our understanding of how these different, you know, psychopathologies and, and, and ways that the brain work, you know, relate to each other. And, you know, there's a whole school of thought kind of, in, you know, critical um, anti-psychiatry people who will say a lot of these aren't even disorders. You know, we're just, this is a, a, a cultural way of looking at different ways of brain functioning and it's the stigmatization and kind of authorization of these ways of thinking that renders them sort of distressing. Um, you know, and I think there's some value to those critiques. I mean, I, you know, my distress when I'm anxious is real. That is not a culturally imposed and it's painful. thing, but, but there, <laughs> yeah. but there's elements of, of that. And, you know, and talk about schizophrenia, um, I know you've done podcasts on that too. You know, that's in some cultures, there's no schizophrenia. Um, and, and, you know, that's, that's a really interesting set of questions in and of itself that kind of goes off in a whole other direction. Yeah. I mean, the whole, the whole language aspect of how we talk about these things, I, I think people underestimate how much the language and the categories impact people. And that's, you know, that was the last podcast I did talking to Nathan Filer, who's written a book about that subject, about schizophrenia, so-called schizophrenia, as he calls it, and delving into the language issues. But I think uh, if, it seems to me like a lot could be solved if more people, more, more uh, clinicians or, or, you know, scientists took the approach of, of, of always pointing out that these are rough human made categories that we've created and they allow us to study these conditions or these symptoms and make predictions about these symptoms, but they don't mean that it's known that you have some discrete condition, you know, they're just, they're just tools. And I think that's what most people would agree with in, in the field. But I think the implication is that these are like discrete you know, conditions that, that tell you something very concrete about yourself. Whereas that, I, that's just not the case. And I think if more people understood that they're, you know, they, they'd feel less either trapped by a, a label or just not put as much value in, in what that, you know, necessarily tells them about themselves. There was a striking moment when I was re researching the book and I was at an anxiety conference. It was a bunch of, you know, experts and clinicians. I think it was in Savannah, Georgia. And this guy, David Sheehan, who was, you know, kind of a giant in the field. He ran a big anxiety clinic in Florida, but was a bit of an apostate. He told this story about how in 1980, when they were doing the third edition of the DSM, it, they were sort of, at that point, they were shifting the, and again, this gets to language, you know, they were, they were changing the neuroses, which is what they'd been previously categorized, kind of using Freudian language from, you know, mid-century. And switching them to anxiety disorders and then dividing up the anxiety disorders into panic disorder and social anxiety and, and simple phobia. And they had carved out a bunch of things. And by this point, you know, panic disorder, which hadn't existed, you know, 10 years before was now a recognized thing. And they were sort of wrapping up and he's telling this story about how there were a bunch of these psychiatrists at a meeting there was the committee and and they're sort of, they're just having wine and somebody says well what about our colleague you know doctor doctor x he he is just sort of generally anxious and he's not he doesn't fit into any of these categories and so these guys sit around they're like well we need to come up with a category that's basically they end up describing generalized anxiety disorder mm -hmm. and then they write this into the DSM3 and then, you know, of course, once it's in there, you can diagnose it, you can prescribe for it, you can get FDA approval for drugs for it, and you can do all kinds of studies for it that how reliable is the description of generalized anxiety disorder. And it becomes kind of reified into a real thing. So now, you know, it is a thing that everybody recognizes and I am diagnosed with it and lots of people I know are diagnosed with it, but it was basically emerged from this conversation over wine among a bunch of psychiatrists, you know, uh, kind of ad hoc. So mm -hmm. it's exactly as you say, there's, there's an arbitrariness to how we make these distinctions. And I think a complicating part of that is that, you know, when people are suffering, there can be that craving for belonging and craving for a category, which I can relate to. There can be a, a comfort to saying I have X, you know, even if X is just a a loose categorization or a loose compilation of, of symptoms. And I think um, that also complicates things too, because people can can identify with those those groupings, even if those groupings are, are rather arbitrary. Yeah. I mean, OCD is a class, you know, th there are benefits to, it's, it's, as we were saying earlier on, that like getting a diagnosis can actually be liberating. You're like, oh, this is why I feel this way. This is why I have these thoughts. There are other people like me. There are treatments for this. I'm not crazy in some new and unfamiliar way, but it can also be stigmatizing like, oh God, I'm mentally ill. Mm -hmm. I'm crazy. And, you know, then there's way like OCD is a real set of, you know, you know many people suffer from that, but it gets, it sort of bleeds out into the culture and lots of people will say, well, I'm OCD. I'm so OCD. And they don't 
mean that they are clinically disordered or, or distressed. It means they have a you know, unusual penchant for keeping things neat or like things to be orderly, which is not the same thing as having, you know, OCD. <laughs> right. It's all, there, there's these various spectrums. And I think it gets back to the, the comforting thing about learning about these symptoms that is that other people suffer from them and, and thinking about how we get through them, how we, um, how we solve them and, and not so much the comfort shouldn't be in like, oh, I have this, this category. Uh, I'm in this category because these are such loose compilations that people can drift in and out of even, you know, when it comes to, you know, things like psychosis and, and things like that. Yeah. So an interesting part of your book was talking about your uncle's, uh, delving into your uncle's psychology reports when he had his psychological problems and went to a mental hospital and such. And uh, one of your uncle's big complaints was around his public speaking, uh, similar to issues you've had where he was basically deathly afraid and made more and more anxious by the teaching aspect of his job, the performative aspect, it seemed to be what agitated him the most. And obviously public speaking is a huge fear for many people. I've had that fear in my life too. And I'm curious if you think that for many people like your uncle, it's possible that they'd be happier if they accepted to some level that perhaps they weren't going to get over that and that they did have that weakness you know, it seems like your uncle was felt pressured to to perform that he he didn't want to accept that he had this weakness, even though he couldn't overcome it for such a long period of time. And I'm wondering, you know, maybe there was a solution where it was like, OK, I accept that I, I have this issue. So maybe I shouldn't be, you know, attempting to teach. Maybe there's another uh, job that would suit me better. And I, I wonder if you see kind of accepting to some level our limitations as, as part of the key to moving forward with some of these issues. Yeah. And it's a really interesting set of questions there. And actually it's, it wasn't my uncle. It was my great grandfather, my mother's grandfather. Ah, sorry. And, um, yeah, I mean, well, a, a few thoughts. One, one is he, he exhibited, I mean, and, and you know, I, I know this just from reading his case reports and, and, and then hearing stories through the family, but it was very similar to what you were talking about at the beginning of the podcast about that sort of downward cycle where clearly he was, you know, he kept ending up in the, in the mental hospital because yeah, it was his anxiety about basically, I mean, I'm sure it was broader than this, but it was fixating on lecturing to undergraduates um, in his political science courses. And he just sort of became obsessed that they weren't up to snuff and then he couldn't sleep and then they would fall apart and his wife was having to write his lectures for him. And he, he, you could just tell he's going off the rails in a way that I unfortunately can relate to quite powerfully. And, uh, and you wonder too, I mean, this was in the forties it started and, you know, if he'd had access to lorazepam, which hadn't come online yet, you know, could he have just broken that cycle and been fine? Like we were talking about, but in answer to the question about, you know, would, would, you know, was he beating his head against the wall and sort of making himself miserable by not accepting? I mean, this is something that, yes, maybe. And, you know, when we were talking about treatment modes, um, you know, earlier on and, you know, there's cognitive behavioral therapy, there's medication, but these days a big, uh, well, there's two, there's two things. There's something called ACT, which is accept, acceptance and commitment therapy, which, you know, the first half of that, the acceptance part is exactly what you're saying. You're sort of accepting yourself as you are and the world as it is. And that also relates to, you know, there's a lot of movement, um, toward mindfulness, uh, meditation as a treatment for all kinds of things. And it's a bit of a fad, but there's, uh, there, there is, good research supporting that it can be quite effective for depression and anxiety. And, you know, there's all kinds of good effects from it. But one of them is is sort of trying to, it's, it's reaching acceptance, coming to terms with the world, with yourself, with your limitations, with your strengths, um, and not trying to change things. And yeah, there's this kind of almost Buddhist idea of, you know, public speaking or doing whatever might make you anxious and maybe you can't do it. You then make yourself more miserable by beating yourself up about your inability to do that thing or your continued failure to do that thing without distress or do it well. And this is something, I mean, it, this hits me to my core because, you know, I continue to have significant public speaking anxiety when I talk to my own therapist, you know, when, if I get offered the opportunity to go, you know, if sometimes I get offered um, what sounds like to me, large sums of money to go give a talk at a university. And it's, at first, I'm like, oh, this is great. I'm being asked to do this. I can make some money. I can meet interesting people and help people. And then I just get overwhelmed with anxiety. And it's all the more so because I'm getting paid. And I'm like, oh, God, I'm going to let people down. I'm going to fail. <laughs> and then I start spinning off the rails. And 
and, and I, and I, it's exactly, you know, that's the question I ask is like, am I torturing myself by trying to do this? Like, and you know, various therapists have said, no, no, you can build up to this. My current therapist has kind of a Zen approach. And again, I have not pulled this off, but he's basically like, yeah, the moment it, I'm oversimplifying, but he sort of says that the, once you accept that you can't do this or that you're okay with whether you do it or not, or you just decide not to do it, that's when you won't be anxious about doing it anymore. And then you can do it. <laughs> um, so it's this weird Zen Cohen, um, except that you might not be able to do it. And then maybe you'll be able to do it. I think in all of these areas, it's, it's so complex. And I think there's something to the, you know, the so-called cliche of the middle path where it's like, there, there are values to trying to do these things while accepting that you may not you know, you, you're going to have a harder time than many people. And I think, uh, you know, for my, in my personal life, I, I mean, I've had that fear of public speaking forever. Basically I, I've had, uh, one of my biggest fears is, is, has been the idea of me, you know, being on TV and, or some sort of televised thing and breaking down in some way. Mm -hmm. And, uh, at, and I, the last big panic attack I had was a couple of years ago when I was talking to a bunch of people having to impromptu, uh, present something professional related, and had a really bad panic attack that I hadn't had in a while and kind of affected me for days afterward, kind of messed up my my uh, chemicals for a while. Uh, but at the same time, I've gotten better at these things, like I, you know, doing this podcast or doing public presentations that I've done for my poker tells work, for example. All of those things have been stressful, but they've also gotten me stronger, gotten me more relaxed at doing them at the same time. But I, I still think at the end of the day, because I know that I do have problems in those areas, like it would be probably self-destructive for me to try to become like some sort of TV personality or some sort of teacher. Uh, I just, I just feel like I know my limitations enough at this point to, to know that that would be, uh, hard. you know, it, I think it comes down to too, that these kinds of ideas can be viewed as depressing, like accepting that you might have a problem, you know, especially in our American kind of zeitgeist of viewing things as, as like, oh, you have to overcome these things. But I think life is only so long, you know, we, we have a short time on earth. And I think if we had a longer period of time, maybe it's like, oh yeah, we've got hundreds of years to, to conquer this thing. But I think part of the, the wisdom is, is accepting like, okay, look, I only have a few decades, which is not a long time. So I'm not going to, you know, what are, what are the chances of me actually overcoming this stuff enough to, to get to the point where I'm, you know, loving it or whatever. I, totally. And, and, um, but the confounding thing is, you know, it's the line between acceptance, which is, you know, really is a form of wisdom and 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 can spare you some misery, but between acceptance and defeat. And and mm -hmm. for someone with anxiety, like, you know, the, my, my concern or my therapist's concern sometimes is if I say, well, I'm, you know, I just can't handle that. I'm not going to do that. And and and, I'm then, and then I'm not going to do this. And that can vary, you know, the, the, the way anxiety tends to work is it grows if you don't confront it or it can grow. And, right. you know, that some people end up, you know, agoraphobics, they're afraid to leave their house because as the circle of things that they feel comfortable with gets smaller and smaller, just because they're not pushing themselves a little bit, you know, it gets, it gets worse and worse. W where's the line between pushing yourself a little bit so that your world isn't getting smaller and smaller versus pushing yourself too hard in ways that are just you're setting yourself up to fail or make yourself miserable or, you know, as mm -hmm. you say, you know, going out and, you know, sort of becoming a, a, a TV star S somewhere, there's a, there's a middle path. Um, and I, I sometimes struggled to, to find it, you know, it's, it, and, and toggle between being like, yeah, I just can't do anything. I'm going to retreat to my bed and pull the covers over my head, either literally or metaphorically, and, and then <laughs> do less and less, or no, no, I'm going to, I'm going to charge forward and, you know, prove that I can do such and such, uh, and then just make myself absolutely miserable. Uh, and, you know, maybe lead myself, you know, to, to, to dangerous breakdown territory. Yeah. I think it gets to these existential problems of, you know, how do, how do we decide to live our lives? You know, what, how much is, how much do we try? How much do we not try? You know, these are all, it gets to these existential uh, human issues. Uh, one of the things I loved about your book was how open you were about your life, your willingness to examine your life, your weaknesses, your family dynamics, potential mistakes of your own parents, and how your children may be prone to some of the same anxious temperament. And I've considered writing a short memoir about my own experiences with anxiety, which involved me dropping out of college in the middle of my second year due to a so-called nervous breakdown. And uh, similar to yours with the goal of saying, uh, I, I don't have any real answers, but more as a way to show, you know, these things do happen and then you can, you can go on to lead happy, uh, happy, normal lives after that. 
one of the challenges I've faced with that is talking about potentially contributing family dynamics, mm -hmm. uh, similar to how you talk about in your book, because if I did talk about that, it wouldn't be in a, you know, my parents are to blame way because I still love them and don't want to hurt them, but more to examine the idea that family dynamics could theoretically be a contributing factor, even if there are other factors like biology or other arbitrary psychological things that can crop up. And uh, obviously doing that can have the potential to alienate family members, even if that's not your intent. And your book examines some of those dynamics even if it was, you know, also very balanced in pointing out that it's not clear exactly what's going on in these areas. But I'm, I'm curious uh, how difficult were those parts of the book to write? And did you struggle a lot with talking about your family in that way? Yeah, it, it was difficult and, and particularly, you know, right around publication. I mean, I, I guess to back up, you know, a lot with the personal stuff generally, you know, both with regard to family and it just uh, embarrassing stuff about myself. Part of the way I was able to do that is, you know, it just, it felt like it was not real somehow. You know, I was writing this almost as an exercise to keep my editor of the book interested. <laughs> and, you know, it seemed like such an abstract concept that it would be, you know, well, in some years, this thing will actually be published. You know, it was like I was writing about a fictional character. It wasn't fictional. It was me, but it was, it just, it didn't, I don't think I could have written it if it was like, okay, this is going to come out tomorrow. And I have to reckon with the reality of that I was able to like put that aside. So, you know, that, that encompassed both, you know, whether I'm talking about like breaking the plumbing at the Kennedy compound or stuff having to do with my family. But with the family stuff in particular, I mean, you know, I, I, I thought I was at great pains to, as you say, you know, I sort of lay out the way I do the stuff about sort of nurture and family as I lay out the case for, you know, how your parents, you know, completely mess you up. It's all your parents' fault. And then undermine that um, and say, no, no, it's not mm -hmm. so simple at all. Let's now turn to biology. And, you know, I think it is, you know, if you read it objectively, my aim was to be, and my true belief is that it is complex and, you know, family, mm -hmm. uh, you know, parenting styles play a role, but genetics play a big role. And even, and that, and that for that matter, to the extent that parenting styles play a role, those parenting styles were determined by the parenting styles of their parents, your grandparents, you know? And so it's like, mm -hmm. everything is sort of determined. And, and I was not trying to lay blame or shame at anyone's feet. But of course, then when your family members are reading it and they're, they're not focusing on the big picture of this balance, they're just saying like, <laughs> oh, you're, you're airing our dirty laundry. Um, so yeah, it was interesting, you know, they're, they're on different people had different reactions, you know, on, on, interestingly on sort of my, you know, my maternal side is the wasp side, um, uh, of my family. And, you know, there was uh, a lot of concern about just airing dirty laundry, even with my, you know, my, my great grandfather, who we were talking about earlier, who was, um, you know, hospitalized many times or over his anxiety, he'd been dead for 30 years, um, or 40 years by the time the book came out. But there was a lot of, you know, is this where, you know, is this fair to him to be publishing his, his dirty laundry? Interestingly, my dad, who I, who's now deceased, but, but was at, you know, alive when the book came out, you know, I, 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 I quoted from his diaries. I talked about how he was sometimes physically abusive to me. Um, again, I was, being trying to be fully understanding and appreciative of the context in which that stuff happened. I, you know, loved my dad. Uh, he was very receptive, you know, he, he was fine with it, you know, and, and in some ways I would say he had the most grounds for complaint about stuff that I put in there. Whereas other people who were more upset by just, again, perceiving um, me to be blaming them or embarrassing them in front of their friends. And they just couldn't see past that. Again, it, it, you know, for, I've heard stories of, you know, people publishing books like this and it just leads to permanent breaks and families and all that. I am lucky. I mean, I'm very fortunate that that didn't happen. And, um, you know, certain family members will not, they do not. I, I notice when I go to their houses, they'll have my other book on display. They do not have this one. <laughs> um, so it's sort of been like, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a sore spot still. Um, but it was, it was, it was worth it. And what I tried to tell them, and I don't, I don't think it will ever fully penetrate, you know, for a while I would send them some of them, you know, I'd get these emails from all these people we were who were saying like, this book helps so much. This is so, you know, I, I appreciate your candor, your, uh, just nice things and, 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 and showing, you know, people receiving positive benefit for the book. And I would mm -hmm. send that along, um, you know, to my mother basically saying, you know, see, this is what I was trying to, and it just, it just, I, after I, a while, I just stopped doing that because it just, it wasn't going to penetrate. <laughs> Well, I think, uh, yeah, I, I think the writing about the family dynamics is a big obstacle for any of these kind of 
kind of books, you know, and, and talking about my own thought on writing this kind of book, you know, I see that as one of the biggest obstacles besides uh, even bigger than any, you know, fear or anxiety about airing my own personal issues. It's it's about the fear of alienating family, which I think is, you know, one of the probable reasons why these books are so rare, you know, to, to talk honestly about these these kinds of dynamics. Uh, but yeah, I mean, to, to your point, I, I would be doing a similar thing where I would be talking a bit about the dynamics, but also talking about, for example, like my grandfather uh, on my mother's side had catatonic schizophrenia, was diagnosed with catatonic schizophrenia when he was in his early 20s and, you know, got shock therapy treatments and such. And I can relate to that kind of class of, uh, of anxiety because that my my anxiety kind of manifested in a, in a similar way, sort of how your your great grandfather, his anxiety manifested in a similar way to yours. I can relate more to this, you know, kind of catatonic schizophrenia kind of anxiety. So that that part of it is is really interesting. But yeah, just even talking about the theoretical factors of, of family dynamics, even if you're not trying to do that in a, uh, a blaming way, is just so difficult. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm curious so, about your your um, you know you, you've mentioned you know your your anxiety and 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 you know social aspects of it. I, I was curious whether, and I don't know if you've written about this um, or, or would write about it in your book, but you know, given your expertise and interest in you know poker tells and and sort of analyzing social behavior, I, I was you know I, I've watched some of your your videos, which are really interesting. And one of the things that I write about in my book is you know how s- the, the the odd paradox of you know some socially anxious people, you know, if they're not on the autism spectrum, part of the problem is that they're they're too acutely attuned to kind of mm-hmm. social cues and they're seeing things that, you know, maybe they shouldn't be seeing or sometimes they're just wrong. They're picking up things. They're too sensitive. Too sensitive. But there is yeah. a, a sense in which they really do have have legitimately keen social antenna. I didn't know if, you know, your skill at being able to look at poker tells and, and certain behaviors emerges from like just mm-hmm. how you go through life. Um, you know, is that is that something that came naturally? I think it is. That is related, I think. Yeah, I, I think it's like you say, it, I think it's being too sensitive and being uh, being too sensitive to your environment and and you know to specifically to other people that can be painful and that can go in weird ways where it's it's going in ways that don't make sense right because you're you're becoming so sensitive and and uh, so self conscious or whatever and attuned to these things that may not be there but at the same time you are theoretically picking up some real things. There, there were some studies about uh, people who had, I can't remember what it was now. It, it was studies about people that had extreme anxiety and being a- able to more easily see indicators of of anxiety or, or sadness in, in people's faces or something like that. But they also had a lot of false positives exactly. too, right? So they were, it comes with a, a range of its own problems. But I think a lot of these problems come, like the the class of problems that I've suffer from do come down to too much sensitivity. Like, you know, speaking of the the benefit of, of lorazepam, it made me feel like I was running on like high alert to make me making me feel like, oh, this is this is how other people feel mostly. They don't feel constantly like like as as if everything's kind of attacking them, you know, and, and I think that's the big yeah. I, I, I do see it all as related. There, there's almost like this adaptive social blunting that happens, whether it's you know an anxious per- person taking a lorazepam or just the way that quote unquote normal people go through like like they are not picking up on every potential perceived negative response uh, mm-hmm. to their you know being in the world and you're right that the, the problem is there's tons of false positive but there is like this extra attunement to anything that is negative or even could be negative and, and you know from an evolutionary mm-hmm. point of view that's an adaptive thing you know like if you're out in the state of nature and you're Sensing being threats. hyper yeah. vigilant scanning the horizon like that could be dangerous like there could be a tiger in that bush or that flower could be poison or that you know member of the other tribe is acting you know his his his, his lip is twitching he's about to attack me but when you're looking at you know going through your work day and and you know you're interpreting every stifled yawn or or you know smirk as this person hates me or i'm boring them or they you know uh they're gonna they're out to get me that is not adaptive Mm -hmm. to healthy functioning and i think that's where the cognitive you know behavioral kind of work comes in where it's you know that was a big part of me me progressing was realizing like all of these things that i thought were slights from other people that where, where I was too attuned, too self-conscious about like, oh, someone looked away, they think I'm weird, or they think I'm uh, strange, or they think I'm unattractive, or whatever, all these things that run through your mind is that are all related to low self-esteem, those kinds of things. It's it's working through those at a uh, more intellectual level to, to recognize like, oh, no, these 
these are people with their own issues. They're not thinking about me. Like, why would they think that about me? You know, working through it more intellectually. Yeah. And, and to bring some of this full circle, it is interesting to me the way a lot of both the depression and the anxiety issues relate to self-esteem. Um, you know, it's the, it's, you know, if you're anxious, particularly socially anxious, you perceive every, your own failure, every negative vibe, you know, directed your way as an indictment of you and yourself. And that's, and they're, you know, and, and, uh, and same with, you know, and depression, um, which obviously relates is mm -hmm. if you think poorly of yourself, uh, and you know, you, you, you end up with these kind of distorted view of the world where you suck and everyone hates you. Um, and, uh, you know, um, the, the, and this is again, where the acceptance stuff, which is something I've, you know, tried to work on a lot in recent years is, you know, if you if you can just accept that you are, you know, we are all human, you're okay, whether you're, um, you know, Michael Jordan or Bill Gates or just an average guy or gal going through life, you're okay. And, and having that kind of baseline level of acceptance goes a long way to heading off depression, anxiety, but easier said than done, at least for me. Do you feel like getting older on its own has lowered your anxiety? I sometimes feel that for me, I feel like getting older has maybe mellowed some of the, the harshness of the, the brain chemical responses or something. Can you relate to that at all? Most of the, or much of the time, yes. I mean, I feel like, you know, it's all the cliches are true with age comes wisdom and the highs, you know, maybe the highs aren't as high, but the lows aren't as low and you, you just gain some perspective. And yeah, it feels exactly like you say, like the intensity every, of everything gets dialed back a little bit and whether that's because of some kind of neurochemical muting or, or dampening, I don't know. I, there are other times when, um, you know, I'll have an anxious setback or, or a bout of depression. I'm like, God, it's just as bad as it ever was. But I think if I step back and were to chart it, yeah, it does, it does decline. And, and I, I also feel like just from reading, you know, both anecdotally and, and, and looking at the studies, I mean, there's all this stuff about how at midlife, despite the sort of myth of the midlife crisis, like once you get in, you know, people, when they get into their forties and particularly fifties and beyond, even though your body is breaking down and your memory is failing and you're maybe past the prime of your career, you actually get more content. And whether that's wisdom or neurochemistry or just your expectations become more realistically aligned with your capabilities, you know, it may be that when you're young, you know, you have unrealistic uh, expectations, but like, you're still so young, you know, you could meet them when you're old, you've, you know, sort of have to come to terms with them. You know, in, it's in midlife, like somehow where, where there's still like a painful gap between your youthful mm -hmm. imagined self image and where you are and where you can actually get in the remainder of your life that it's most painful and you get past that and things get better. Something you talk about towards the end of your book is the pattern that seems to exist of every few generations there can be a lot of focus on a new outbreak of a new form of anxiety and the reaction that this is something new and unprecedented. For example, there were thoughts around the beginning of the industrial revolution that the stresses of modern industrial life of city life was causing so much stress on people. And then there were the, there was the big onset of anxiety uh, diagnoses and medications in the 1960s and, and onward. And I'm curious if, you know, with your work on studying anxiety over history, if you see this as, if you see anxiety as generally increasing or generally staying the same, and maybe just, if it's staying the same, maybe it's just taking new iterations or, or people are looking at it from different angles. Yeah, it's a really complicated set of questions because of issues of both you know, nomenclature, like the language we use, we may have been describing the same thing in different ways across time and of measurement because we measure things in different ways. And, you know, diagnoses can drive perceived incidences. So, you know, as new drugs come online and they get approved to treat, you know, say social anxiety disorder or panic disorder, which didn't exist in 1975, suddenly by 1995, they're rampant, but that's because, um, you know, there are drugs to prescribe them and doctors are diagnosing them and insurance companies are reimbursing based on them. It's not like panic, the experience of panic attacks didn't exist in 1975. It's just, we didn't have the terminology to describe it and the drugs, you know, to, to, to treat it. So stipulating that it's, it's really hard to say, I guess, you know, having looked at this and I, I was really interested in how, you know, different, how anxiety and the experience of anxiety manifests in different cultures at different stages through history, because I do think that, you know, it does get, you've got these sort of biological experience of what we call anxiety getting transmuted into different symptoms, you know, whether you're in Japan, which has one set of values versus America, which is a different set of values, you know, sort of individualist versus more, you know, collectivist or shame versus guilt. 
my, my, you know, I, I, I guess boiled down and, and to oversimplify, you know, I think there is more or less a fixed quotient of propensity to experience, you know, to have a high strung temperament and to be neurotic and what we call neurotic and anxious, you know, across the human population. Um, you know, there may be genetic variations, but basically, you know, one third of the population is, has a predisposition to acute anxiety that then gets sort of filtered through, um, the cultural historical moment. And, um, you know, I think that times of great change, you know, change is anxiety provokes. And so, so moments of change and disruption, like, um, the industrial revolution, when you had all these people moving from agrarian life to the cities and, and just whole different ways of organizing and understanding their life. Or now where you've got sort of digital disruption of everything. And I mean, put aside the pandemic, which is of course, anxiety producing, but you know, the, the, and, and just sort of, you know, capitalism with its demands on the individual as opposed to on the community. I do think those moments tend to exacerbate the, the you know, just distress generally and the, and the form of distress that we call anxiety. I think it does make it worse. Uncertainty, the experience of uncertainty triggers anxiety. And so when you have cultural, economic, political moments like we've been living through lately, that does make anxiety worse. So I think, you know, anxiety has been getting worse. You know, there, I, I've seen anecdotal articles about obviously the last year rates of alcohol consumption, but especially benzo consumption, you know, Ativan um, and, and others you know, being way, way up. Again, that's not surprising given the pandemic. But even, you know, before that, I think there's been, there, there, there's plenty of anecdotal evidence that you can kind of, it, it's hard because you can cherry pick evidence d different directions, but I do think maybe anxiety is increasing and that, you know, certainly since like 1975, we, we are in an unusually anxious period in, in Western life. Personally, I think the internet and social media by connecting us together so tightly. And while there might be, you know, positive effects of that greater communication, that, that quicker communication, I feel like it has an amplifying effect in terms of agitation and, and drumming up conflict because it feels like we're thrown so much tighter together. And in a piece I wrote about it, I, I put the idea forward that maybe it's acting as sort of an amphetamine on, on normal human interactions. I'm curious if you see, you know, because obviously people like John Haidt and other people have written about these things amplifying uh, anxiety and depression in children and, and other people. I'm curious if you can relate to that or if, if, if you think it's very uncertain still. I think it's not provable, but I think it's absolutely plausible. And I would say in my own view, likely, uh, uh, for, for, I mean, I think your you know metaphor of the amphetamine injection into human behavior by the internet is, is, is right. I mean, it, it's sort of the way it's designed, you know, and, and, and to kind of, I mean, it is a sort of an addictive dopamine quality to just, you know, wanting to go and get that like on Facebook or whatever, or the share on, 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 on Twitter, it, 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 it sort of, you know, and the, just the way we share on Instagram and Facebook sort of exacerbates the self-esteem issue. I mean, it's, it's sort of everything about it is designed to um, augment the worst parts of human connectedness, like the comparisons mm -hmm. and the particularly, you know, in the last five years, you know, the tendency towards polarization and to kind of, you know, make in-groups and out-groups and just, you know, and it's much easier to dehumanize people when you when you're Distant. not seeing them in person right. and so it's so it's like it's it's very it kind of very cheaply trades on and traffics on and by, and by it i mean you know social media but the internet generally and media um you know it, it traffics on outrage and quick hits and you know it's not not big on nuance subtlety mm -hmm. human connection mm -hmm. um you know even when you're building connections it tends to be tribal in a in a kind of atavistic you know not productive way because it's usually tribal as defined against other tribes who are made into the to the enemy so i i just feel like it's you know and again myself you know i'll spend time whether it's playing some stupid video game on my phone or or you know doom scrolling twitter it's like eating potato chips you just you feel horrible after you've done it for too long or at least i do mm -hmm. um you know particularly lately uh, you know last last few years yeah, I think there there can be a tendency for people to downplay these things where they're like, well, look, we've we've you know, people said the same thing about books. They said the same things ab about TV and we're still here, you know, everything's fine. But I think that doesn't acknowledge the truth that all of these communication media have changed us, you know, books changed our behavior, uh, TV changed our behavior, maybe in the, in the case of, you know, shorter attention spans. And mm -hmm. it's entirely logical that every, every shift in communication will change our behavior. And there's also the tendency to act like, oh, things have been fine, but it's such a short 
you know, our, our history is such a short sample size. At some point, some technology will change things in a significantly, a significant way that doesn't have to be positive. You know, that at some point, something negative, majorly negative has to happen. So I think there can be a tendency to kind of downplay or excuse these things just because like, Hey, look, we're still functioning. As, uh, we're still around. No, it's like, the, it's like the guy who falls off a building, you know, 28 story building and someone le- le- leans out the window when he's passing the 14th floor <laughs> and said, how's it going? He's like, oh, it's totally fine. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. So far. Uh, so is there anything, uh, th- thanks a lot. This has been awesome. Is there anything you'd like to mention that you're currently working on that you're excited about? Uh, no, I'm, I'm mainly just uh, kind of pushing the plow at my day job at the Atlantic uh, magazine. Um, you, know, you can check that out at Atlantic.com. I, I am, I, I've sort of been struggling to come up with a good, new, exciting book idea and have had a bunch of half-baked ones that I haven't you know, managed to get to to kind of launch velocity. So, but I'm open to ideas. So, you know, you can, um, my, my website is scottstossel.com and my email is there. So uh, any ideas, send them my way. Great. Is that the is that the best way people can keep track of what you're working on? At the, is is that the website? Uh, honestly, I don't keep it terribly active, so no. Probably a better way to do it is my Twitter handle at uh, Stossel. S Stossel. Okay. And I will say yes, the Atlantic is one of the few things I have subscriptions to. So I and I, I recommend it, especially the last couple of years. I feel like it's given more nuance on issues than. I've gotten from other sources, and that's one of the reasons I like it. Uh, excellent. No, that's always that's always really nice to hear. So, thank you. Okay, thanks a lot, Scott. This has been the People Who Read People podcast. You can learn more about the podcast at readingpokertells.video/blog. If you liked this episode, you might like the previous one where I talked to Nathan Filer about psychosis and schizophrenia. You can follow me on Twitter at a poker player. If you like the podcast, please give me a rating or review on iTunes. That's probably the most meaningful way you can show your appreciation. Thanks for listening. Music by Small Skies. Small Skies.